who had been called by God to Macedonia by this immaculate vision, could we have ever expected him to now be sitting all alone without a traveling companion? Because we have to remember that Silas and Timothy were still being brought over from Macedonia. Could we have ever expected to find him now sitting alone out of Macedonia in Greece, sitting in Corinth by himself? When we encountered that vision, didn't it seem to all of us like the literature was setting us up for this heroic story of church planning? Because remember, he gets this vision of this Macedonian man begging for help, and he follows it immediately. And then all he faces in Macedonia is persecution. And now he ends up out of Macedonia, seemingly unaware of the state of the churches that he's helped plant there. I don't know that as readers we could have ever seen this kind of plot twist coming. I think what the literature was setting us up for was, like I said, this amazing story of Paul going around Macedonia, performing great works and churches sprouting up because, remember, he was being guided by this vision from God. And yet that's not the story that ends up being told. We have to expect the unexpected. And, and really everything about our faith and the story as told in the New Testament has, has been somewhat unexpected, hasn't it? We didn't expect Paul to end up out of Macedonia and Greece, seemingly broken by himself. But we also didn't expect to have a Messiah who ended up on the cross. And we also didn't expect for his church only to really begin after he ascended into heaven and left it in the hands of others. Everything about this Christian story seemingly sets us up for the unexpected, doesn't it? So as missionaries, as disciples, even as just day-to-day -day believers, I think there's a very clear message here that the plan will almost never play out as our human minds conceive of it, and we have to always be prepared for an unexpected plot twist in our lives to come up, especially those of us who decide to venture out into the world and be missionaries. Now, as I poured over commentaries and, and Bible encyclopedias and stuff going through these verses, because as you may have noticed, uh, simply from analyzing the text, it doesn't seem like there's a lot there, the habit among scholars is to do these psychological gymnastics and, and really try to dig into what Paul might have been feeling and thinking. And as nice and useful as that might be, I don't know how honest of a work it can be because Scripture doesn't tell us anything about what Paul's thinking and feeling except for a short mention in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, which we'll talk about later. So rather than try to get into this psychological analysis of Paul here in Corinth or wonder what he might have been feeling to try to find some application, I simply want us to approach these first few verses as readers of the Word. The application might not come from Paul's story, but it comes from our reading of Paul's story. The idea is that none of us could have expected that by following a call to go and preach and plant churches in Macedonia, Paul could have ended up broke and alone in Greece. So sort of this life application for us then is to always expect the unexpected from our ministry. Things can and will undergo sometimes rapid but very meaningful change. The longer we take on this mantle of being disciples and the more we go out and move in the world as God's servants, the more things are going to change and happen for us. We know as careful readers of Scripture that nearly nothing ends up the way God's servants expects it to end up. It certainly didn't end up the way Paul expected. Remember, at the beginning of this missionary journey, he was simply revisiting a lot of locations that he went the first time he decided to become a missionary. And now he's in a whole other part of the world, isolated by himself. And yet, as we go on, we will see that the best thing we can keep doing when faced with these unexpected twists and turns is simply to keep sharing the gospel with all of our passion and all of our enthusiasm and every bit of strength that the Lord has given us. In verse 2, there's another sort of unexpected twist when Paul meets this married Jewish couple, Aquila and Priscilla. Now, I know when I was talking about the unexpected just now, it seems like it was always sort of this doom and gloom sort of thing, that the unexpected, these big plot twists would always lead us to some big challenge or something hard to do 
some form of persecution or isolation, but, but the truth is that sometimes the unexpected is actually a really good thing. I don't want us to get the impression that it's always bad. As we saw in Athens, and we'll again see later on here in Corinth, Paul is outside the sphere of Jewish influence. Remember those first cities he went to in Philippi and Thessalonica? There's a big synagogue network there. The Jews seem to have a lot of local pull. But now here in Athens and Corinth, in the more Greek and Greco-Roman cities, their influence dramatically shrinks, which means that Paul's coming across a lot less Jews, which means he's finding less and less people with whom to start sharing the gospel message. So the fact that he comes upon a married couple of Jews, Aquila and Priscilla, who he can fellowship with, is actually kind of a miracle. And in Scripture, it only mentions them as Jews, but... I think from context, we can reason that they were probably Jewish Christian believers because had they just been Jewish in nature, they probably would have spoken out against Paul as so many other people had before. And Scripture also tells us that these people were not actually from the area, that they were native more in Italy than they were in Greece. So it's, again, an unexpected plot twist that these two Jews would even be in Corinth for Paul to meet And then they end up becoming two of the best friends, I think, that he ever makes on the second missionary journey. They actually come up in some of his epistles, as we'll see later. Now, we're going to talk a lot about just the nature and the character of the city of Corinth. And and what I want that to prove is our second major point, which is simply that Jesus can build his church anywhere. Last week, we were in Athens. And when I was blessed enough to come up here, well, I guess not last week, the week before last, When I was blessed enough to come up here and share that message with you, uh, we framed it as something of the New York City of the ancient world. It was a great city of the world. It was rich in culture and philosophy, had a lot of cultural exports, and of course a lot of commerce that came through there. So there was money, politics, philosophy, and culture all flowing through very strong the city of Athens. So if Athens is like New York, then I would have to argue that Corinth is something closer to the Las Vegas of the ancient world. Sort of a lesser than great city of the world. Um, Obviously a cultural hotspot, um, (laughs) but it had a very unfortunate history and and shares a lot of things in common uh, with the modern day Las Vegas that I think we'll get to in a sec. About 150 years before Jesus walked the earth, the city of Corinth which had been commercially successful since its founding as as a shipping and receiving kind of city, was completely leveled and emptied. The city of Corinth took part in a bigger rebellion against the Roman Empire, and in response, the imperial government sacked the city and burned it to the ground. They took the population and sold them into slavery. And only about 100 years later, in 44 BC, was the city refounded. Julius Caesar saw it and said, you know, based on location alone, this would be a good spot to make the capital of this Achaean province. And so he ordered the city to be rebuilt and repopulated. But along with regaining its former glory, the city of Corinth also regained what was at the time its biggest cultural export which unfortunately was a societal obsession with sex and licentiousness. Perversion, in other words. So when I say it's like the Las Vegas of the ancient world, I think that's the most immediate connection that we can make. It was a city that had a cultural obsession with perversion and sexual license. The phrase being like a Corinthian or Corinthianizing was known publicly to mean behaving in a sexually immoral way. That's how common the reputation of the city of Corinth had become. It had actually entered into the vocabulary of the local area. The city's most prominent altar to an idol was actually built to worship the Greek goddess Aphrodite, who was the goddess of love, beauty, pleasure, and reproduction. In that temple, in that altar, there were 1,000 government-employed temple prostitutes who made the city of Corinth something of a tourist attraction. 
I think now you see where that analogy of being the Vegas of the ancient world is starting to come to life. This city had one thing with which it could attract everyone in the region, and it sold it extremely well. So in Athens, Paul is surrounded by some of the most intelligent minds of the area. He was in a city that had this grand tradition of philosophy, politics, and profound thought. And he even described the citizens of that city as being extremely religious, even though they were given up to idols. Some translations maybe get it a bit more accurately and describe them as extremely superstitious. But we get the picture of the people in Athens being completely sold out to this faux spiritual life as they worshipped idols. But now he comes to Corinth, a city with really no sense of tradition since its history had to be completely restarted. But it's completely filled with sexual immorality. So in Athens, where everyone has sold themselves out to idolatry, in Corinth, everyone has sold themselves out to the most savage and animalistic of desires. Which of the two cities, as a reader of the word, would you assume the church can actually find its roots in? The one with a lot of very smart people who have a lot of intellectual openness, who are welcoming to new ideas? Or the one that's filled with prostitutes and men and women who would rent the services of prostitutes? Which one sounds like the more likely candidate to receive a church and actually support it? A or B? I'd say with our modern minds, A is probably the best choice. A lot of very smart people to carry forth the word, have this tradition of listening and hearing to new ideas. And yet, in another unexpected twist, Corinth becomes the city where a very passionate church sprouts up. It ends up having its own problems, of course. Paul had to write letters to them twice to keep them on the right path. But at least they supported the idea And this very fruitful church began there. Since arriving in Achaia, Paul's preaching has had to contend with these very powerful cultural sins. In Athens, it was idolatry. In Corinth, it's licentiousness turned into perversion. It doesn't sound like the kind of place that we would expect to go to build a church, does it? Jesus, however, calls for a global church one that reaches even into places like Corinth. We don't get to excuse ourselves from ministering in these very difficult places where we would rather not go because Jesus wants his church to be everywhere. And believe it or not, there are churches even in Las Vegas. I don't know how good they are. I've never been to a service. I don't often go to the city. But I know that they're there. There's actually even a monastery on the way to Vegas out in the middle of the desert for those of you who might prefer the monastic life. So now we have to tackle a new question. Last time I was blessed enough to be up here sharing with you guys, we looked at Athens and we saw its obsession with philosophy and politics and we we asked this question, do we now live in sort of a globally expanded version of Athens? And I think we reasoned that, yes, we do. Well, the question to ask today is not, do we live in a globally expanded version of Corinth? I think the world pretty much proves the point. It's harder to detect an obsession with philosophy and politics, but an obsession with sex makes itself very visible. And for anyone who has been out there engaging with the culture lately, the answer to the question, do we live in a modern version of Corinth everywhere we go, seems to answer itself. Absolutely, yes, we do. From the very young to the very old, licentiousness is the one thing that sells well across all age groups. And unfortunately, our culture has become hyper aware of that and is more than willing to sell it at every turn. So the question then isn't whether or not we belong to a modern day Corinth. Because everywhere we look, we see that sexual immorality is now being championed. It's not just being talked about, it's being held up, assigned a certain nobility, which is one of the landmarks of an era that I think a lot of us would call absurd. Among worldly men, the expected behavior is to behave like an animal. 
It's the stuff that's talked about between high fives. This idea of locker room talk exists as a byproduct of a culture that has sold itself out to pornographic and perverted thinking. Meanwhile, among women, the truth isn't much better. This kind of behavior is hailed as the reclamation of their bodies by a culture who feels that women have been oppressed for centuries now. So the question is not whether we live in a modern-day Corinth. It's how are we going to help Jesus build his church in this modern-day Corinth? How do we follow the legacy of Paul and move into a world obsessed with literally everything but the gospel and help to spread the gospel? This brings to mind our Faith in Action Day because next week we're going to a place that, like I said, no one would expect us to go. It's not a place that's going to be looking to find the gospel message. It's not a place where we can be expected to be seen by fellow believers and cheered on by our brothers and sisters, but it is a place where we know that Jesus wants his church to grow because he wants it to grow everywhere. And so no matter what, I'm confident in our decision to go and serve there and to celebrate anyone who we get to serve that day. For us, this is a special single day, this Faith in Action Day. Although the truth is it should probably be more than that. It should probably be more like a lifestyle. But for Paul, this was his daily experience in Achaia. What Paul did every single day in this part of the world, we have the luxury of boiling down to a single event. Our third major point today is honestly a bit removed from that, and it simply speaks to the ministering effects of fellowshipping with one another. Verse 2 of chapter 18 reminds us that Paul found a Jew named Aquila and his wife Priscilla. So in this most unwelcome foreign city, Paul finds two Jewish believers, two Jewish Christians, Aquila and Priscilla, We have to remember that he arrived to Corinth alone since Silas and Timothy were still on their way from Macedonia. Now, I said earlier that we could reason that these were Jewish Christian believers because even though Scripture simply describes them as Jews, they don't actively try to persecute Paul, which seems to be his relationship with the Jews in this part of the world. And instead, they actually become his friends and seem to welcome him into their family business. Other Jews in Corinth will eventually hear what Paul is preaching and bring him before the Roman proconsul, sort of like a governor, named Galileo, and demand that he be prosecuted for preaching a faith that encourages lawlessness. But Priscilla and Aquila, for their part, do the exact opposite. They meet Paul and they say, you can come work for us and stay with us for as long as you're here. And they form this loving, fruitful relationship. So that's why when I stand up here and say they were probably Jewish Christian believers, I can be confident in that assertion because they don't immediately try to hand Paul over to the Roman government like the Jews of the synagogue in this city do. Scripture tells us that these two had recently come from Italy because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. I was waiting for this part because now I get to put on my history professor hat and tell you a thing or two about this expulsion of the Jews from Rome. You see, at this time, we're now in the 50s AD, early 50s, Romans and Jews and Christians agreed that any conflict between Jews and Christians in Jerusalem was strictly a Jewish religious argument. So the Romans actually didn't try to involve themselves too much, except for when those religious arguments turned into violent riots or protests or uprisings against the Roman government. And we know that in Jerusalem around 51 AD, there was a lot of civil unrest between the Jews and the Christians. There's a Roman historian named Suetonius who puts the blame for all of this civil unrest on a character that he only calls Crestus. If the name Crestus sounds familiar, it should, because he was likely mistaking the title of Christ and assuming it to be some Jewish political advocate who was causing a lot of disturbances in Jerusalem. So Crestus is likely a mishearing of Christus, which means that all of these frequent dust-ups in Jerusalem were because of the proclamations of the Christians there. 
who were going around preaching about the Christ, about the anointed one, about the Messiah. So the preaching of the gospel message in Jerusalem creates a lot of these small riots and protests and arguments between the Jewish synagogue and the Christian church, and it eventually becomes so much, Claudius, as mentioned in Scripture, is the Roman emperor Claudius, that he looks at the situation in Jerusalem and says, fine, just get rid of all of them. I'd rather not deal with this. Let's just kick them all out of the city. Rather than actually trying to deal with the conflict as it was, because again, the Roman government didn't really want their hands on this, the easiest solution was just to empty the city of all of the riffraff, as it were, and return to a more peaceful state. So Aquila and Priscilla are native to Italy, were likely in Jerusalem at the time of the expulsion, and are now kicked out and end up in Corinth. Aquila and Priscilla, according to Luke, are only in Corinth because of Claudius' expulsion of the Jews. Now, we won't get too far into it right now, but this expulsion is actually a huge turning point in Christian history. It marks the end of the systematic oppression of Christians by Jews, which had been the story throughout most of this New Testament narrative, right? Because now the Jews have been kicked out of what was their power center. And in Jewish history, we actually see an effort after this expulsion in 51 AD to gather themselves together in opposition to the Roman government. Rome will actually go on to level the city of Jerusalem because the Jews actively rebel against the government. But that part's neither here nor there. Because the Jews now focus their attention to rising up against Rome, they focus less of their attention on persecuting Christians. And Christians, for their part, because they've been lumped in by the Roman government with the Jews, are motivated to start making a more visible and audible separation of their faith from the Jewish faith. Because at the time, the Roman government actually didn't differentiate between the two. They saw the Jews as Jews, and they saw the Christians as sort of Jewish plus. They didn't make a cultural differentiation between one faith and another. So Christians now, motivated by the expulsion, begin to cultivate some of their own church practices and bring the Christian message more to the forefront. And we see a shift from Jewish Christianity to more of Christianity as we know it in this era, sort of a more Gentile Christianity, because the church is now trying to noticeably distance itself and establish its own identity separate from Judaism. Now, that becomes extremely important because by making themselves visibly separable from the Jews, the Roman government can point to Christians and say, well, we hate them too. Just a few years after this persecution in 51 AD, Emperor Nero ascends to the Roman throne and begins outright murdering Christians by the hundreds and the thousands. I'll spare you from the horror stories about what Nero did to our brothers and sisters in that age. Um, but I will try to actually someday develop an entire series of messages about persecution in the early church. Maybe sometime in like 2030 when we're out of Acts and the new building is up. So we see that this expulsion is included in here, one, to provide some historical context and explain why Aquila and Priscilla were in Corinth, but for us, it's a marker, a huge marker of an event in Christian history. In some of the biblical studies classes I've been privileged enough to take, a lot of people argue that the Bible is not written as a history book or can't be read as a history book, but when you come to passages like this, I just don't know that that argument is justifiable. Granted, Paul didn't date and name and, and give the exact location where the account of Acts was written, but we have events like these that serve as sort of mile markers for where in history all this is happening. Verse 3, and because they were the same trade, he stayed with them and worked. Remember, the major point here was about fellowship. All that history stuff was just sort of my privilege to talk to you. And because they were the same trade, he stayed and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. Now, Acts 18.11 tells us that Paul stays in Corinth for a year and six months. So this wasn't a short trip. During that time, Paul stays with Aquila and Priscilla, and they go on to become two of the dearest friends that he makes in the entire world. They welcome him into their business, and he takes up his former career as a tent maker, which was not a metaphor or a euphemism for anything. He literally worked with leather and made tents, 
fitting in with the line of business of these two. So in a place so foreign to Paul, in a region that had so far mostly rejected him, Paul is finally able to find two more people who he can fellowship with, and he gets to stay with these two believers for a year and a half on his missionary trip. Now, like I said, it's not really worth it to try to dig into Paul's psychology when he arrives at Corinth, but he does give one mention of it in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3. He says, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And that's him talking about his arrival to Corinth. So since he's revealed about himself that he arrived in this weak, fearful sort of state, I think it's fair to assume that Priscilla and Aquila, Aquila were a welcome source of respite and rest from Paul's uneasiness about being there. The church actually once approached Corey and me about managing this new sort of greeting program where where we would stay at the front of the church and we would greet new visitors and we'd get whatever information about them we could, you know, what they did for a living, where they lived, how many kids they have. And we would then use our knowledge of everyone else in the church to sort of pair them up. We can see from this story that that's an extremely effective strategy for building relationships. Paul and these two Jewish Christians bond over a common trade. He works for them and they welcome him into their homes. That was the ethic behind that program. Obviously, it didn't really work out. As you may have noticed, Corey and I no longer hover around the front of the church and try to pull new people in. But the ethic behind it was the same kind of thing we're seeing here, getting Christians to bond with one another over at least one common thread, over a common interest or a common trade, a job, a family situation. And we see that this sort of early bonding establishes very fruitful Christian relationships that go on to accomplish incredible things. This wasn't just a strategy to get people to come into the church. This was a strategy to get people to start forming relationships with one another to empower them even greater as disciples in the world, to accomplish incredible things. Paul leverages this relationship with Priscilla and Aquila to build an entire church. Priscilla and Aquila opened their home to that early church. Paul goes on to tell us in Romans that they were actually the hosts of the church in Corinth, that it happened in their house. Those are the kind of relationships that we want to see budding here. So when I stand up here and I yammer on about life groups, it's not some invention that we came up with that we want everyone to be involved in. It's a very effective ministry tool as told to us throughout the entire Acts narrative. Life groups are purposefully organized to foster these kinds of relationships so that we might have our own version of a Corinthian church, although hopefully one that's a bit more disciplined than they were because I will not be writing any epistles in my ministry career. Which brings us to our last point today, simply the observance that that we had a church born in Sin City. 18.4 tells us how Paul did it. He went into the synagogue and he reasoned every Sabbath and he tried to persuade the Jews and Greeks. There's an interesting sort of shift in language here because throughout earlier chapters in Acts, it doesn't tell us that Paul tried to persuade anybody. He just did it. He persuaded and he dialogued and he talked. And now all of a sudden, he tries to persuade them. There is no try. There's either do or not do. As he had done in every city previous, Paul follows his pattern of going into the synagogue the home of perhaps the only people who could relate to teachings about Yahweh and the Messiah, and he makes his best case for the gospel there. This is how the Corinthian church was born. Paul preaching in the synagogue, Priscilla and Aquila opening their home in the heart of a city overcome by sexual sin and perverted idolatry. It was not by a state decree that established the church, It was not some grand revelation given to an entire city. It started with a small group of dedicated believers who gave their time and their resources and, as we'll see next week, endured great frustration and plenty of pushback from the local community. They built relationships with one another and used them to minister to each other, to keep each other strong and going in the process, and they stood up for their beliefs in the face of potential persecution. Again, this is all stuff we'll see happen in Corinth as we continue in the story. They 
they got to stand before the government and actually justify their beliefs, which is something I assume we'll probably never have to do. But through the power of these relationships was something they were more than capable of doing in Corinth. If Jesus can use these kinds of events to build a church in the middle of a city completely given up to sexual sin and the worshiping of false gods, imagine what he can do with these kinds of people and these kinds of events in a community like ours that's not yet, I think, completely lost to this line of thinking or completely lost to this kind of sin, but has just enough seekers left in it that we might be able to build and empower a great church that moves and makes real, effectual change in the community. As our worship team joins us again, we'll consider our next step. We know that the Lord desires a global church which means he will use us to build it in some unexpected, even unseemly kinds of places. I want you this week to examine the world around you from your local community to the global community. Consider where the gospel is most needed, but not just most needed, where it's least expected and how you can bring it there. Thank you so much.